And we'll talk about now regression where our predictor variable is categorical. And let's think about this distinction of categorical versus, say, continuous or quantitative. Uh, the foundation of regression models is, was built on that our predictors, our x's, are quantitative. If you're a measurement uh, person, you might think of them as having interval or ratio levels. It facilitates uh, interpretation of regression coefficients for a one unit difference in age or something like that. That it, it just keeps marching up. It's a variable that keeps on having different values. Often we have categorical variables. You might see them referred to as nominal or qualitative variables as predictors. Uh, things like, at least historically, how gender has been coded as categorical. Uh, religious affiliation, experimental treatment, treatment or control, or you get this treatment, you get this treatment, you get a control. Um, occupation, marital status, a medical diagnosis. Uh, many often, uh, often these predictors do not have natural scales. If I want to measure my participant's religion, how do I score that with a number? It's not obvious to me that we should. Often the choice of scaling is arbitrary. So if I have a variable like sex that is assigned at birth in two categories, this is typically done, um, I could assign one of the categories a zero and the other one a one. Or it could be zero and two or negative one and one. And all of those are different choices for different purposes that might have advantages. But it's really arbitrary. I could call one category negative 42.3 and another category 17.8. That's not really helpful to me, and those numbers are hard to think about rather than zero one or one two or something like that. But the point is, the number isn't so much a number as it is a name. But if the numbers are in some sense arbitrary, our regression coefficients are going to be tricky to interpret. Like, What's a one unit difference in religion? I don't know what that means. And let me just say on a little bit of a detour uh, before we get into this, this, this is changing. Or uh, the, the data analysis world is catching up to more of a sophisticated lens on a lot of our variables including things like sex and gender. Um, so historically, this was coded as a two-category categorical variable, male, female, both for sex, gender, and sometimes sex and gender used interchangeably. Uh, we could argue that they should not have been. Um, here is uh, like a screenshot of NSF, the National Science Foundation, and how it collects data. What sex were you assigned at birth on your original birth certificate? Male, female, I do not wish to provide. What gender do you identify with? Male, female, other, I do not wish to provide this information. It wasn't always this way. It was male, female for a long time. So we're actually at a, like a turning point in our data collection history where so much of our data that has been collected in social, behavioral, human sciences has treated sex and gender one particular way. And moving forward, I think it's gonna be treated quite a different way. And a lot of the examples that I use come from an earlier time when we said we collected data on gender, male, female, those were the options. Importantly, we're moving away from that. Um, so there, here are other options. Uh, what, uh, another kind of survey, what sex were you assigned at birth? Only two options. What is your gender? A few options as well as do not identify as male or female in different ways. This happens all the time that we have a co-evolution of variables, that there's things in our data sets, constructs, the ideas we'd like to think about, interpretations, data collection, data analysis. This is the purview, or, the, or this pertains to the field of measurement, especially validity. So if I think about the construct or the concept of gender, how I choose to measure it, what options I give, or what data I'm willing to collect can have serious impact on my results. Um, often, you, what's the saying? You, you go to war with the, with the army you have, not the army you want. You do data analysis with the data that you have, not the data you want. It is often the case that I say, the data that we've collected on this thing, like gender, is really incomplete. Not in the sense that I'm missing some scores for people, but that it comes from a very limited notion 
of the idea of gender or something like that, or religion or things like that. So it's not the complete understanding of the, the thing that I care about, but that's the data that I c can get access to. Let's turn and look at regression models. We're going to start with one predictor that has a categorical variable with two categories. This is as simple as we can get, and we'll build up from here. Um, so each uh, research factor or design element or something categories subjects into one number of groups or categories. Call that like G for groups. And the idea is that uh, participants or cases you only get in one group. So a grouping variable of some kind or categorical variable, one person can't be in multiple groups. If it is, we need a more complex story. Uh, but the groups are not ordered. Uh, there are many systems of doing this. I I'm, I'm more partial to some of them than others. I use a lot of dummy coding in my work. There are more kinds of uh, ways of coding things that are useful for um, different kinds of inferences, particularly in experiments. I don't do a lot of experiments in my work, so it doesn't really show up all that much for me. Uh, the difference in coding will yield different regression coefficients, the numbers that come out of fitting the regression model. But the overall conclusions are still the same. You're not going to say, well, when I coded the variables this way, the R squared was 0.2. But when I coded the same variables <laughs> that way, it's 0.8. No, that's, that's not how this works. I actually did think of something. <laughs> That's not, not to do it, but like it's no. Like that's it. not. Yeah, you'll get a different number for the coefficient of the different categories and things like that. But in the end, they are translatable from one to another. Um, the point is that each of these schemes is as a set will produce the identical results. If I have some number of categories, I'm going to need one fewer categorical variables. So if I have two categories, you're in this group or you're in this group. I need one variable to capture that. One variable that de designates who's in this group and who's in that group. Why not two cat why not two variables? If I have two categories, my intuition might be two variables, one for each category. Mm -hmm. Why not why does that not work? What do we think? Not sure. Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is, hey, one binary variable, two category variable, that captures the two groups. If I have, if we're doing something like, are you in group A or group B? Mm -hmm. If I have a variable that is labeled, are you in group A, yes or no? Well, then if I know you're no, I already know you're in group B. Yeah. I don't need a separate, are you in group B variable to capture that. This has to do with like information theory, which is that a binary variable, one, bit of information helps you sort out a distinction between two things. But also multicollinearity. Oh. If I have two predictors, one is are you in group A, yes or no, are you in group B, yes or no, mm. everyone in group A is a yes there and a no on group B variable, and vice versa, try to put both group membership variables in a regression, perfect multicollinearity, it won't work. I see this all the time. People come and say, I have a six category variable. I made six dummy coded variables. I put all six in as predictors as a set. Regression didn't work. Yeah, you don't need six. You can only use five. One fewer than the number of categories you have. We'll see this in data sets too. Uh, the most, I think, most popular way of doing this kind of coding is called dummy coding. This is where group membership is coded as one, a non-membership coded as zero. So I have a, a predictor that's a dichotomy, two category, whether or not you've received a treatment. So a one indicates you've received a treatment, and a zero indicates you did not receive the treatment. I could code it zero one or 304 and negative 17.95, but it's arbitrary. Zero one has some benefits for interpretation, as we'll see. Uh, so this is, um, again, using the data that I have, using gender coded as female and male uh, for, for students to predict their SAT score. That's the outcome variable. Here's some summary statistics, mean, standard deviation, sample size, 
I'm going to code uh, 0, 1, and I'm arbitrarily choosing 0 for female and male for 1. Well, in that case, wait a minute. If x is a 0, 1 variable, what is the mean of the x's? We formulate a mean by adding up all the scores, dividing by the number that are there. If we add up a bunch of 1's and zeros. Well, the zeros don't add anything, right? Adding zeros doesn't change the total. But adding a 1 each time for every 1 will up it. So a mean of 0.36 is, that's the proportion of 1s in the data set. That's the proportion of males in the data set. A couple of different ways I could look at my data. It's always useful to look at data. Here on the vertical axis is SAT score. The horizontal axis is my grouping of gender, uh, 0 and 1. And at each value of x, uh, I have a box plot. The middle line is the 50th percentile or median score. The box is the 25th to the 75th percentile. That's the middle 50% of the data. And then the whiskers extend out to most of the way out to the highest and lowest scores. So there's my females group, males group, and I can see, is there a group difference here between males and females? Maybe, doesn't look to be overwhelming. Here it is as a scatter plot. <laughs> oh yeah, all the points are gonna stack up at different values of the x, zeros and ones. Oh. Okay, so these are all the, uh, coded as female gender, their SAT scores, male gender coded as, coded as male gender SAT scores. And I can actually see the difference in the group means. If I just put the, the uh, folks coded female in the data set, there's their average. I drew on a horizontal line right at their average, 1,040.48 on the SAT. And for males, it's 1,087.11. A little bit of a group mean difference here. Uh, I could look at correlations too. Correlations really not built for having um, categorical variables, but you can run the analysis and you can see it's a very weak correlation. Uh, you may have gathered that just by the scatter plot. Let's do a regression. All right, there's my generic representation of the model, and here plugging in for my example. Predicted value of the outcome variable, in this case SAT, is equal to intercept plus slope times predictor. In this case, this is my dummy coded variable for gender. The regression model will capture the relationship between the predictor, gender, and SAT. It is also a model of the difference in group means, or conditional means. There's that regression line. See the regression line in there? Yeah. This is a re totally reasonable regression to do. Importantly, uh, the parameters of the model convey things about the means. Recall our interpretation of a regression intercept. The intercept is when the predictor is zero, or independent variable is zero, what do we expect for the outcome? Well, when the predictor is zero, who's that? That's the females. So for the females, the expected value on SAT is just the intercept. In the population, the population intercept, beta zero, that would be the mean for females in the population of SAT. In fitting the regression model to a sample data, the intercept is literally gonna be the sample mean for females, the group coded is zero. Do we see that? that you just plug in a zero here. Hey, that's what the intercept is, the expected value when the predictor is equal to zero. That's a convenient choice of using zero for one of the categories. It makes the intercept equal to the group mean for the group coded zero. Yep, so here we are. This is our plot. 
I highlighted the mean of the females in the sample data as 1,040.48. So when I fit regression, that's exactly what the intercept is. Not close to it, exactly it, it had to be. All right, how about the expected values for males? Let's see, when gender equals one, that's the males in this data set, the expected value is, all right, let's plug in a one for the predictor. Intercept plus slope times one. The slope times one is just the slope. So the expected value for males is literally just the intercept plus the slope. In the population, the population mean for males would be the population intercept plus the population slope. So what's the group mean difference in the population? The mean for males, well that's that intercept plus slope, minus the mean for females. You said that's the just the intercept. Hey, that gives us the slope. The slope is literally the difference in the group's means, in the population, and also in the sample. So the slope conveys the difference in group means. If I'm just doing regular old descriptive statistics, okay, I got the mean for females, I got the mean for males, I could do the subtraction, it comes out to 46.63. When I go to fit this regression model, guess what the slope is gonna be? 46.63. Really convenient to code things as zero and one because then you have these very easy interpretations of the intercept and slope. Yeah. Yep, the group mean for males of 1000.87 is literally the intercept plus slope times the value of the predictor, that's one. Makes the math really easy. Just to show you the kind of total summary of the results, there's my model, R squared is teeny tiny, 0.03, not explaining much in the way of the area. The model is statistically significant. I got a huge sample size, a couple hundred people. So this is saying it's statistically significantly different from zero. And yeah, we've, we've talked about this. That's the mean for the group coded as zero. That's the difference in group means, standard error. Significance value, yep, significant, 95% confidence interval for those terms, sure. Let's do statistical inference. In regression, we often care about the slopes. And the null hypothesis is that, hey, the slope is equal to zero in the population. Well, that would mean that the mean difference in the population is zero. There's no difference between our groups. The alternative hypothesis is the slope is non-zero. The difference in means is non-zero. There is some difference in groups. Uh, if, uh, and based on our sample, we fit the model and get a, a slope. If that's statistically significantly greater than zero, we reject the null and infer that well, the mean for the males, the group coded as one, is larger than the mean for females. If the slope is statistically significant and less than zero, we'd, infer, we'd still reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the mean for females is larger than the mean for males. If it's not statistically significant, we would not reject the null that the two group means are equal. If you've encountered things like a t-test or analysis of variance of group differences in means, it's exactly what this is. We've just done a t-test through regression, looking at the difference in groups. That's precisely what is conveyed. I'm gonna focus on the slope. There's my estimate. Is it statistically significant? Yep, oh, and I even get a 95% confidence interval for the difference in means. This is an independent sample, or equivalent to an independent samples t-test, where the difference between males and females and their group means on SAT. There is another assumption that's lurking. What is an assumption of the independent samples t-test about the variances? What's our assumption about error variances in regression?
Not about whether they're normally distributed, just think about the variances. Are the variances supposed to be the same or are they supposed to be different? Our assumptions. Think back to when you learned a t-test or in what we've talked about in regression. Homogeneity of variance. Yeah. In the t-test it is the means of the two groups are allowed to be different, but the variances are the same. In regression, the means are allowed to be different, that's what a slope captures, but the residual variances are the same, the error variances. It's the same assumption as a t-test. That is, we look and say, is the spread, the variability of the errors at each point on x the same? Looks reasonably about the same to me, the, the variability within each group. So somewhere in your statistics training, you might have learned about a t-test. You can just replace that with regression with the categorical predictor. Regression handles the t-test. Then why would anyone uh, prefer to use the t-test? If they're not familiar with regression, or it gets you the same answer. It might, it might seem simpler or quicker to them to do a t-test. I can execute a t-test through regression. A little note of caution. Um, for the standardized solution here, um, we might say uh, the standardized coefficient, where is it there? Yeah, 0.16, it's the standardized slope. So more generically, or the standardized score of SAT and the standardized version of gender. So it's a 0, 1 variable that now we're subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. I, I, I would just say don't don't deal with standardized solutions when you have categorical predictors. Just don't, don't present or pursue things in that way. I'd much rather talk about the unstandardized solution. Because I don't like standardizing a dummy variable that captures group membership. You can do it, and there are ways to make sense of it, but I almost never do that in my work. I don't recommend it. Okay. Let me just quickly wrap up uh, this portion of things. Here's how I would write things. It's kind of typical regression-y paragraph. A sample, I got a model, regressing the outcome, descriptive statistics on a predictor. Descriptive statistics for gender is, well, it's more of a proportion of percentage. Using dummy coded, the model was significant, F test, P value, R squared, T tiny. The coefficient, I'll tell the reader, is the mean difference. And there it is, standard error, statistically significant, which supports the interpretation that males perform better than females on the SAT. And I'll give you a 95% confidence interval for that slope, which is also the 95% confidence interval for the difference in means. Uh, so what we've been just introducing now is we've got a predictor that, unlike anything we've talked about before, is a categorical variable. We've started with one predictor and two categories, the simplest situation so far. What we saw is, hey, the intercept, if you code things as 0, 1 as a dummy variable, the intercept is the mean for the group coded as 0, and intercept plus slope is the mean for the group coded as 1, so the slope is literally the difference between them. What that means is we can execute group comparisons of means, t-tests, through regression. So we have come for the t-test and we have swallowed it with regression. Guess what's going to happen to ANOVA? We're going to swallow it with regression. We'll do that next time. Yeah. Next time, we'll talk about regression with a categorical predictor in more than two categories, more than two groups.